Hello everyone! Substance Designer 13.0 has just released with a batch of astounding new features, amongst which the spline and path nodes. This is a real game changer that we know a lot of you have been asking and waiting for, so we are very excited to present it to you. This system offers a new way of working that can seem a little puzzling at first, so in this video we are going to provide you with all the basic knowledge you need to get started. And the first thing you may notice is that we're actually talking about two new functionalities path and splines. Although they can work together, they rely on different methods, and so we'll dedicate each of them a separate video. All right, let's start with splines. Splines can be roughly defined as curves controlled by a set of points. They are a separate category of objects in Substance Designer. Just like the flood field, they require specific nodes to be generated and modified before being run through other nodes. So what exactly can you do with splines? They open so many doors and have so many creative applications that one video wouldn't be enough to cover them all. Let's just name a few. For example, shape creation. Remember when you had to fiddle with shapes, transform 2D and warps to get specific profiles? No more. You can quickly block out silhouettes by filling splines, which is both more precise and more predictive. Since splines also store vector information, they can be used to generate bridges, map textures, and yes, scatter elements along them, which unlocks a whole new playground in Substance Designer. Spline points also come with height and thickness data, which lets you control how things overlap and taper. Are you hooked yet? Let's jump into it. Before you begin using splines, make sure you have the right setup for it. When you open Designer, go to Edit, Preferences, then go to the Projects tab, under Compatibility Display, make sure you have Engine V9 selected. Also, if you're used to working with in-context editing, it's a good idea to turn it off for performance reasons. Just go to Graph and untick Enable Graph Editing in Context. It should be disabled by default. All right, so where do we start? If you type in Spline in your search bar, well, a lot of nodes show up. And this can be daunting at first, but don't worry, it's not as complex as it looks. If you want to have a full picture of the spline family, you can also head to the library and open the spline and path tab. Tooltips will appear as you hover over each node, but also over each parameter. A useful reminder if you ever get lost after this tutorial. You might be thinking, but there are too many nodes, where do I even start? The good news is that there's a specific order to follow that makes things really easy to grasp. There are 24 spline nodes in total. Now, don't run away just yet. They can be grouped into four categories. Creation, Assembly, Modification, and Render. Creation always comes first, and Render always comes last. In other words, you start by drawing a spline, you combine it with other splines by chaining them up or appending them. You then refine them if needed using modifiers like the warp. And finally, you use the resulting splines to generate certain effects, mapping, filling, scattering, etc. And of course, it's all non-destructive, so you can at any point go back to your first spline and adjust it. So now let's go over each category, starting with creation. There are two ways of creating splines in Substance Designer. You can either trace them manually or extract them from a mask using path. We'll go over this second method in the next video, so let's focus on the first one. To trace splines, just type in spline in your search bar. We have three drawing nodes there. Spline circle, spline cubic, and spline polyquadratic. These three nodes will always be your starting point when working with splines manually. So let's just bring them in our graph. The spline circle does a fully customizable circle that we can scale, move around, trim, turn into a spiral, and much more. Then we have the classic cubic and quadratic splines that you can control using these handles. Another way of creating splines is by tracing bridges between existing splines. So if I take, for example, the two splines that we just created and feed them into the spline bridge, I will get this awesome array of splines that I can customize as I want. 
Now you'll notice that all the splines display a little dot at the beginning and an arrow at the end. These are actually temporary helpers that are just here to remind you where the spline begins and where it ends. You can disable them in the preview tab at the bottom of every spline properties. And this is really important. What you are seeing here when double clicking these nodes is only a preview. It is not the final result that you are going to use in your graph. You can already tell by the look of the outputs. These are spline data, not regular grayscale output. It means that this needs to be processed through another node before being used. So again, these parameters that you'll find at the bottom, like the thickness, the resolution, they only control the preview, not the final usage. As a good rule of thumb, if a node has these three yellowy outputs, it means that you're still in spline mode and need to use a render node to get out of it. Before we move on, let's take a closer look at the polyquadratic spline. It is the one that has the most options and you'll probably end up using it a lot. By default, it comes with four points aligned in the top left corner, but you can add up to 10 points using this slider right here. If you want to go beyond this, you'll need to use point lists by enabling the use point list option. You can then add several point lists like this, each one adding up to 10 points. But let's keep our spline simple for now. I'm going to trace some kind of knot with it, like so. Now each of these 10 points come with its own properties, and this is where things start to get really interesting. You can control the smoothness, the height, and the thickness of each point. To preview the thickness, just enable Show the Thickness Envelope in the Preview tab. Now I can refine my spline, make some point thicker, adjust the height. You get the idea. The information that I'm building up here will then be handed over to the render nodes that I'll use in the end. So let's just save this spline for later. Now that you know how to create splines, let's talk about how to assemble them. There are three ways of assembling splines. Append, connect, and merge. Let's start with append. What exactly do we mean by that? You can think of it as grouping. You round your splines up in one bundle, but they still behave as independent splines. To append splines, you can either chain them or use the append node. You may already have noticed that the spline nodes all have inputs. Well, these inputs are used to chain splines together. So if I were to create three splines and connect them all together like so, and by the way, if the three connections don't come together for you, make sure you're in material mode. So if I were to connect them, I would end up with all of them grouped in the last node. But grouped doesn't mean merged. I can still extract any of those splines using the select spline node, for example. This node lets you take out any spline or range of splines from a group. You can also isolate them directly in your process nodes by opening the draw menu at the top. Connecting is one step further than appending. Changing one spline will affect the spline that is connected to it. To connect splines together, you want to enable either or both connect to start and connect to end option that you'll find in the properties. To adjust where the connection occurs, you can switch the connection mode from auto to manual, then adjust the offset with the position slider. And now your two splines are attached. Finally, if you want your splines to act as one long single spline, you'll have to merge them using the spline merge list node. Now to merge splines successfully, you need to pay attention to two things, the direction of the splines and their order. Make sure they are placed in an order that flows naturally from start to finish and that you have no facing directions. If you have, just use the flip direction button to fix that. You now know how to create and assemble splines. That was the most complicated part, so congratulations if you've made it so far. Now, say you're happy with your spline setup, but you maybe want to make a few adjustments before actually using them. The Spline Transform 2D lets you scale, rotate, and move around your splines without breaking the tiling. Again, 
Don't forget that you can't use the regular Transform 2D here, as it will not only break your tiling, but also lose all the spline data in the process. With the Sample Height and Sample Thickness nodes, you can modify both of these properties using maps instead of points data. They come with different sampling modes, which is really useful. By default, they are set to Texture Space, which uses the whole image input. Horizontal modes, on the other hand, will sample one line of the image for each spline, which can be very useful when aiming for accurate placement or to randomize the effect across multiple splines. And both of these nodes come with blending modes as well, that let you control how you want to override the previous data. Finally, the spline warp will deform your splines using either a grayscale or vector input. And it comes with very nice options, like the ability to attenuate the effect either with the sliders or with the map. And here again, you can switch between different sampling modes. Alright, so you've put a lot of effort into making and refining your splines. Now you want to finally use them in your graph. Let's hop over to the render nodes. There are quite a few of them, as you can see. And you'll notice that they all have in common this regular grayscale outputs. That means you're leaving spline mode. I'm going to take the spline we created at the very beginning and run it through the various render nodes that we have here so that you can see what each does. Let's start with the render spline. This one will trace a final grayscale version of your spline and also account for the information previously built, such as the height or the thickness. The spline fill will fill the area between splines or within a closed spline. Be careful, if you have multiple splines, they need to be properly merged beforehand for it to work. Otherwise, you will get errors and artifacts. The flow mapper generates a flow map based on your input splines. You can control its intensity, direction, and thickness, letting you do some advanced warping. OK, now let's talk about the one you're probably expecting the most, the scatter on spline. It's a bulky node, as you can see, with a lot of options, but you can think of it as a cousin to the tile sampler, so most of the parameters should feel familiar. Unlike the tile sampler, though, you'll notice that by default, the scatter has a bit depth of 8 bits. That's because it inherits its bit depth from the primary input, which, in this case, is the background input. As long as this input is left empty, your scatter node will default to 8 bits. The best way around this is to plug a placeholder that has the desired bit depth. In this case, I'm just going to add a uniform color, set it to 16 bits, and dock it to the background input by pressing D. So let's hook our spline to it and see what we got. The scatter mode is the first important parameter. It lets you control the spacing between your patterns, you can choose between shape spacing or shape amount. Shape spacing allows for a consistent spacing across all your splines, no matter their size or angles. If you lower it to zero, it will give you a nice continuous ribbon. Just like in the tile sampler, you can input custom patterns and control how you want them scattered. You have a random mode, an index mode, a spline mode if you have multiple splines, and you can override the beginning and end pattern if you wish. Below it is the Duplicate tab, which will repeat the scatter with an offset. It comes with interesting options, such as this circular mode that lets you flip your pattern on both sides of the spline. Next are the size parameters. Nothing that you don't already know here except that drop-down menu at the top. You can choose to use the thickness information of your splines to drive the size of your pattern, which is very useful. Now you can do some really advanced scattering using your splines. Moving on to another very powerful node, the spline mapper. What this node does is that it will stretch a primitive along your splines, then generate UVs for it. This allows you to map any textures you want onto your splines with a high degree of control and precision. The mapping account for the height and thickness data as well, so you can have a consistent result no matter the complexity of your setup. And you can also twist your UVs like that, or by using a curve input, which is amazing. The UVs you generate in the spline mapper can be retrieved and reused by that little UV mapper companion node. It allows you to reuse a specific mapping without having to duplicate the spline mapper each time, which would have a toll on your graph efficiency. Similar to the spline mapper, the bridge mapper generates UVs, but this time using bridges between splines. 
We can then map a whole area like that and have some sort of lattice control over it. And just like the spline mapper, you can reuse its UVs using the UV mapper node. Splines open a new world of possibilities in Designer, and we've just scratched the surface in this video. I still hope that this introduction managed to excite your curiosity and that you'll be soon creating amazing spline-based artworks.